Hi, I'm Wayne Jones. Welcome to Writing and Editing. This is episode 167. Even social media require manners, right? My guest is Kristen Johnson, who is a writer, screenwriter, and ghostwriter. She is the author of the award-winning and award-nominated book, Ain't You Got No Manners, a great book about social media etiquette that's both accessible and well-researched. She was a joy to talk to not only about this book, but about parts of the rest of her writing career as well. Hi, Kristen. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Wayne. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here on, on this lovely day. And I have to say, I really liked your podcast episodes, especially the one that seems very timely with uh, with where you interviewed chat gpt there's quite a, there's quite a bit of that in the news i just saw something this morning uh that said it hel it's helping people write wedding vows and for for the, your listeners benefit i used to have a poetry business where i would write custom vows toasts poems uh for right, right. all occasions but but weddings too so it's kind of interesting to see how that chat GPT has actually um, some writers fear it's going to supplant them. Some view it as an ally. I've attended seminar that says it's it's a tool for writers and not a replacement. So it was rather which your interview with chat GPT seemed to suggest, no? Yeah, and the other, it's interesting too what you say about that. About you used to have a sort of a like a poetry business or whatever that or a service. Uh, that's always the question: Is te technology going to help or is it going to completely replace? Uh, like I was just thinking, for example, I live in Canada, in Ottawa, in the capital, and I noticed that the uh, drug stores where I go to, or the big one anyway, they've completely replaced the checkout person with four or five different, uh, you know, automatic checkout, your, your, your stuff things. So that's the case where, you know, the, it goes more and more and you can imagine, I could imagine anyway, that the future might be where, you know, someone won't be able to run a poetry service like you any, like you did anymore, you know? Uh, it's a, it's a frightening thought. Uh, on the other hand, I, I can, there is a school of thought that says that, human in input and human creativity will always be needed. And I think that debate's been raging in science fiction forever. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, because uh, although humans have done a lot of damage to the planet, uh, we still, I think, generally would like to hang around as a species. <laughs> we would. We would. I mean, it's not like the Matrix, um, since movies are kind of the topic of this conversation, where we're going to be batteries for the super intelligent AI. Yeah, yeah. I also wanted to ask you about your book, though, as well, which I was telling you just before we started recording that I had a lot of, actually, I said fun, which I did. But what I, I have to tell you what I liked about the book, you've got a book called Ain't You Got No Manners. Mm -hmm. Speaking which, of technology. Yes, yeah, exactly. And the U is spelled you, <laughs> <laughs> just like this. And the thing I liked about it was that I could see a book like that being written very light, lightly so that, uh, I mean, I loved your tone in the book, your person, your personality is there, but I could see it being written with not much substance in a way, because in a certain way you could see everyone could give their opinion about email or TikTok or Twitter or whatever, but I, oh, found, yeah. but, but I found it very uh, well-researched for one thing. And I like the uh, the the design in the sense of uh, most most if not all of the chapters had uh, what they call take what you call takeaways at the end, uh, and that's useful for me anyway, and maybe for lots of people who read through something and as you're reading it, you say yeah yeah yeah, but it's nice to get a bullet list at the end to say actually here's what you read, you know a little reminder. So I I, I thought that was because I can imagine that it being a, a lightweight book just because the topic is so broad, but it's not. It's actually, when I said that I, I enjoyed reading it, it's 
fun and funny in places, but it's super informative as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you, that you enjoyed it. It was obviously written a bit ago, so things have uh, proceeded a pace since then. I, I, AI, I think, wasn't uh, even thought of to this degree, except in any of my science fiction. I don't think that anybody foresaw the explosion, except for a few theorists, for one thing. The rise of TikTok, that was not on the horizon. And I'm definitely going to update the book because it is, I think it's even more important what with the way that the metaverse, there's another thing that came up in the last few years. Sure. And all of, all of these things, deep fakes, metaverse, TikTok, uh, shadow banning, so on, just a whole host of things that we have no idea. And of course, there's all this Zoom etiquette now, talking about Zoom, because of for two years during COVID, we were all stuck on Zoom. Right, right, exactly. Uh, I'm glad to hear that because uh, the book, I think, was published in 2016. And right. seven, seven years may as well be a century as far as the internet goes, right? So, Yeah, that's definitely on my, but on my list to update, uh, you know, a, an update and expanded second edition, so to speak. I could easily see that. No, it would be not only adding things, but uh, revamping things. The latest I've heard or I've been reading about, I'm a big fan of Matt Taibbi, who's this very independent journalist. Oh yeah. On, um, on Substack. And now uh, when he first, he was given what are now called the Twitter files by Elon Musk when when Musk bought Twitter. But <laughs> now Musk has banned Substack from Twitter. So now, <laughs> now uh, Matt has abandoned Twitter and he's moving over to Substack and he's calling it the only place for free expression on the internet. <laughs> so. Oh my God. Well, it's it's kind of interesting to see how that how how that is shaking out. I'm not sure about the ins and outs of that, but I do know that these tech fights do happen. And uh, Elon Musk buying Twitter definitely has to be the story of the decade, so to speak, in terms of yep. tech other than AI. Yep, that, that, that's a good point. But but to get back to your book and, and the style of it, uh, uh, you do deal with you know what people broadly call social media, but you start with uh, the old well, granddaddy or grandmommy of them, which is email, email mm -hmm. etiquette, I guess, if, the, if that's the right word. Uh, I mean, that that's a, and, uh, you know, they used to call it the killer app that's been around for, you know, it's been around so long that some users of social media don't even use it. You know what I mean? You hear, I heard that, you know, say uh, Gen Z people think of email as being, it may as well be parchment. Well, and that wonders, that begs the question of what happens to parchment. Although I think there's still nothing uh, better than getting an old fashioned paper card or letter, especially when you have you have a birthday or a special event or especially with a sympathy or get well. I mean, there's just nothing like that. But I think email is still going to be around for a while it's it's, oh. it's critical it's it's easily accessible to everybody and it it's just something that is not phased out i don't see being phased out anytime soon i know that younger people love to do texting and chatting and things like that but it, i think email is going to be around for a while and you might as well learn how to do it well and People don't always do it well. No, it's a good point. It's sort of like, a, I think of it as like a business app now. I mean, it's hard mm -hmm. to imagine a modern business of any size being run without email uh, these days, right? Oh, email marketing, which I've done. I've done, I've written newsletters. I've done email marketing. I mean, that's the way that you get most people's attention, I think. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, I wanted to start with one. You had one, or you have one chapter where you talk about the. I think it's about the internet generally, and I like this quote from it. Here's a quote from it: 
it was basically on the topic of uh, uh, it has some nice quotes of people saying, oh, it's on the Internet. I'm sure I'm sure it's true, <laughs> <laughs> which, of course, is a naturally funny thing. Uh, you say trust, but Googleify, trust, but verify, trust and call the company, person, institution to check the information you read on the internet. And I think that's uh, that's well taken, that, that's very true. I used to work in a university library and one of, ah. the, one of the things that I think was often lacking with students, and you know, you're, you're talking about 19 year olds, is that they weren't able to tell the difference between what's a scammy source and what's an, what's an extremely authoritative source. And those that's an important skill, I think. Uh, I, feel, I feel that's what you were touching on there. Absolutely. And it may not be scammy because you know how sometimes people will say, will really believe something, even though it isn't necessarily true. It doesn't mean they're intending to defraud. I think it's all about intent, but people that pass along uh, things, cures that they've heard on the internet or conspiracy <laughs> theories and things like that. Some of which turn out to be true, but others, others are just, you look at that and there's think there's no way that can be true. No way that can possibly be true. And then, but they believe it. So it's, I guess it's a matter of what we call our bias or echo chamber or what have you. It's a good point. I'm glad you said that about conspiracy theories because one person's conspiracy theory is another person's uh, seeing the facts that mainstream media won't report. And that often conspiracy theories turn out to be quite quite true over time or, or whatever. So they're not all they're not all created equal. It's probably true that Hillary Clinton wasn't running a, uh, a sex shop at a pizza hut in whatever it was during the campaign. I, that that's a yeah. Thing. But you know there are others like you know you hear about the Kennedy assassination that you know maybe that wasn't such a conspiracy theory after all. You know so exactly exactly. So with the internet, you have to discern. You have to figure out what's true and what's not true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's such a, it, it's hard to think, you know, the, uh, uh, my area of study used to be uh, the eight, 18th century England uh, literature, and that was a time when, you know, printing had only been invented 300 years before, and there were only a certain number of books, and you could probably say at some time, I've read every English book that's ever been written. Now, it's just such a a ginormous amount of information they have. I mean, which is just little slivers that we know of, know of it. So uh, uh, it, it's a, I wonder, does that feel overwhelming to you? Or does it feel like I just need to control and organize a bit and I'll feel comfortable? That's a great question. You know, that's such a great question, especially if I'm getting into uh research for a project, which is always a like a project like this one, which happens to be about the internet. That was, that was a mountain of information. It was just a matter of selection. I think the selection is where it's, is where it's key and not just limiting yourself to the, to the internet, uh, just pulling from a variety of sources. Uh, other projects, you know, there's just so many sources of information that I could easily overwhelm the project and let the research, let the tail wag the dog, as it were. Because right. if you let the research overwhelm everything, then it just kind of becomes, well, you're just regurgitating what you know, what you know, and not shaping the message to deliver meaning to the reader, deliver what you really want to say. And I, I find that too with uh, research about, for example, medical conditions. If I'm researching medical conditions, and I'm not the first one to just think I have symptoms because I saw them on WebMD, but I do think that uh, some of the medical information out there is very valuable. And occasionally, I, when I panicked, I've looked at it, and oh, okay, this is totally normal. No need to worry. No need to rush to the doctor. I'm, I'm okay. This is what I need to do. But at the same time, just because you read it on the internet, it's not a substitute for actual medical advice. That's right. 
And just to step back, uh, that's an extremely good point you make. And I totally agree with you about you can't just say, OK, I've got 50 sources here. I'm just going to put them all there and let the reader make their best way through it. It's your job as an author to synthesize and to come out with either your take on it or your presentation of what the balance is or something. Uh, I'm happy to hear that. And from the I didn't get a chance to read your entire book, but from what I read, that's what you were doing, that there was a, a path you had even though it, it, we're talking about the mess of the internet. Absolutely, absolutely. And because of uh, my publisher and editor's belief in this project, which had a, long, had a long way around to get, originally it was supposed to be a straight etiquette book and then got shelved for, for years. And then my uh, late editor was uh, going through her files and she was, she revived it and she said, why don't we do this, but update it with internet information because the information about technology and cell phones and email was outdated. And I said, how about letting it be an internet manners book? And the answer was immediate yes. And then my late mother developed the think button to the concept of the think button to think before you really post something, right. which is something that we all, we all could use help with because everybody, I mean, I quoted some examples in the book, but there are so many more every day about people posting something that ugh, gets them in trouble. And it's just, I mean, it's not even just the, the obvious ones like politicians, celebrities, it's, ordinary people too, as I, as I state in the book, but my mom wanted the think button to remind people to just have some mindfulness when using the internet. And right now they do have an unsend or, or a delete post or pause and are, and they have warnings. Do you really want to post this? Do you really want to send this? So I feel very good about that. We've come so far, but it really, you use, need some human discretion and discernment, which is not always easy to do when we're emotional. And also, I think I remember uh, reading in your, uh, in early on in your book, something about uh, uh, never post anything when you're angry or when you're drunk, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the, that's the worst time, right? And there used to be an old, an old saying way back when uh, that was something like, uh, what is something like you should never write anything that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the New York times or something like that. The idea being that, you know, if you expose something personal, that's going to come back and bite you at some point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially since things can be hacked, screenshotted, uh, forwarded to somebody by accident, even if you set your account to private and so on. I, I talk about the Finsta and Rinsta with uh, Instagram where, where, where the, uh, the Finsta is the, is the uh, outward Instagram. The Rinsta is a real Instagram where, where it's private and, but you can actually share that if you screenshot it. And the, yeah. I love your quote. It's similar to a quote by the great humorist, Will Rogers, who I also quote in the book, uh, and he said, live in a way that you would not be ashamed to sell your parrot to the town gossip. <laughs> That's nice. That's exactly. <laughs> oh, Will Rogers was full of those. Will Rogers was great. <laughs> I've never heard that one. That's very funny. <laughs> it just conjures up such a beautiful image that of someone who's uh, lived a very, say, messy life. And he says, I'll damn it, I'm going to sell my parrot. And, and the gossip has it, and the parrot is just spewing information. Not funny, of course. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, but uh, but comical, in a way. Yeah. yeah. Dark oh, comedy. Good. But anyway, just to, just to finish up on the book, uh, you, you cover everything from... Uh, 
soup the nuts, as they say. I, I mentioned that you start with email, but you cover texting and scams and trolling and a huge amount more in, in, in the book. And uh, I'm happy to hear that at least you at, you at least think it's a good idea to update it after uh, after seven years or so. So definitely. Yeah. Can I ask you also about uh, just this is just taking a real left turn here in a certain way. Um, uh, self publishing and indie publishing. This is something that I've talked about a lot on the po the podcast in various yes. with various people, either with traditional publishers or with authors who are trying to subside which route they go, or with uh, hybrid publishers. You know, they call them hybrid publishers now. The the ones that provide sort of full service for a for a self published author. What are your views on like we're indie publishing or self-publishing, whatever you want to call it, fits into the the universe of traditional publishing and hybrid publishing and whatever other kind of publishing? That is a really great question. And I think that with, with the public explosion of publishing platforms, and now you have apps where, where you can devour stories and things like that, uh, you have Kindle, you have everything, I think that the publishing market, like anything else, is widely changing yeah. because the way that we consume content is, is changing. And trying to for an author to try and break out is not easy. I've been an author. I've I've counsel. I've been a ghostwriter. I still ghostwrite. I I counsel authors. I consult, and I think that there's no one route for authors because every book has a home but not every book is going to be find that home with one of the big publishers that's right which which is like winning the lottery i would never say never and i and i think that if you can go that route absolutely more to, power to you if you've got the drive and the talent and sometimes the connections to to do that then then more power to you. But not every book is going to be a, a mass market appeal. We like all like to think they are, but something some things will appeal more to other audiences. Not everything's going to appeal to everyone. You have, for example, a sports book. I've contributed to two sports book. Now, not everybody is going to be into baseball, even though people love baseball. That was one of the books I edited. Not everybody is going to be into soccer. That's one of the other books I contributed to. And that's fine because we all have different interests and it's a way, and you just need to find your right readers. And maybe the traditional publishing, the big publishing is not that way. Maybe a mid-list publisher or an indie publisher that's really hungry it's similar to screenwriting sometimes you will not get uh, your your movie may not be the one that's going to be your screenplay may not be the one that's sought after by a major studio which again we'd all like but we've got to face reality uh, the only business that i think is tougher than uh, publishing is screenwriting and the movie business right uh, even though with both you have this explosion of platforms and contents especially with streaming netflix paramount plus it's just and now people are actually going back to the movies uh after covid uh, i think audiences are desperate for that but we've all become used to this uh these vast glut of content and these options so i think for authors it's a, a matter of finding who's your audience and what's the best venue for that and if it's self-publishing and if you want just a limited audience like your friends and family or um, a certain segment market segment then that's great but if you want a more bro a broader audience then you have to look at what really is the best fit for your book. And in any case, write something that's really well done because I have seen self-published books that are horrible. I have also seen uh, traditionally published books that I think 
how did this make this past the editor? Because the editors are the gatekeepers. I believe you had a wonderful interview with an, a professional editor on your podcast and editors are the unsung heroes. I've been an editor. I've used editors. Editors are definitely the unsung heroes. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you too about the many things you said there two I would pick out one is that um uh, uh being published with the traditional publishers is not the be all and the end all it's not as if if you don't accomplish that that you're it's a failure of some kind the other side of that is that if you indie publish either by yourself or through a small publisher, you may be aiming at exactly the readership that wants to read your book. So that's the that's the flip side of it. Uh, and, uh, and you're right, I totally agree with you also about traditional publishing. Uh, I've read some extremely poor books, uh, either, uh, you know, editorially, or just sort of content trash kind of thing that you wonder, I don't, I'm not quite sure, how did this make it through? There must be many layers in a publishing house, but uh, yeah. So yeah, so in a way it's encouraging, I find that uh, it, that indie, there's no, no one talks about vanity publishing now. People talk about indie publishing and, and self-publishing. It's another venue. Well, I think that there there is that term out there, and I've seen it, vanity publishing, because, and I think it's still something of a dirty word, but there's nothing wrong with trying to uh, trying to publish something with knowing knowing your limitations and knowing what your audience is and and doing what you can reasonably do. Now, that doesn't mean that there's uh, that you should go with somebody that promises unrealistic uh, expectations, uh, big royalties, bestsellers, things like that. That's usually a scam right there. And whatever you do, do not fall for one of these emails that, that tell you they want to publish your book because nine times out of 10, that is a scam because they will, you Traditional publishers don't really go soliciting authors through email or phone. And if it's through the phone, nine times out of 10, it's somebody in a foreign country with yep. uh, that is doing this as sort of a, a phone bank. And you can tell right away that it is not genuine. They are not going to call you. You have to make the effort to find them. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's tempting. It's really tempting for authors to say, oh, they're emailing me. They want to buy my book. They're calling me. But no, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Um, those kinds of the people that call you wanting to get your book are probably if you through an agent, if you got one, or or through a connection, which can happen. It's still about who you know. Don't underestimate the power of networking, by the way. Yeah. Knowing someone, right? Yeah, and actually that's true what you say. I didn't uh as part of the the you know, I I I'm often poking around online about the podcast and I came across this guy who was uh saying he would publish books and he gave courses online and people paid for that and all that sort of thing. And uh, I was I probed him and probed him and probed him until he got a little upset with me. But basically, he was talking about things like, well, we don't need editors because we have spell check and Grammarly now. Why do we need any editing for the books that we produce? So, you know, I quickly realized that I wasn't going to be interviewing him. So <laughs> can yeah, I ask? I can... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I was just going to say I agree with you. Can I ask you a couple of things about other aspects of some things that you do? You've got a very broad kind of uh, resume, if I can put it that way. Do you still have time, given the other things that you do, to do, and you briefly alluded to it, um, to do coaching and editing and counseling of, of authors, taking on uh, clients? Do you, do you still have time for that? Yes, I do. I I absolutely do. I, I still take on coaching and editing and consulting, ghostwriting and all kinds of things of clients and authors, because I'm always 
looking for work, I'm always hungry and I'm always looking to sink my teeth into new projects and to help authors. Look, you even you even maintain the metaphor there. You're always hungry and you sink your teeth into it. A lot of people mix up those metaphors. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you too, the, uh, one of the, my second last question is about, uh, I saw, and this was fascinating, uh, that you were a semi-finalist in the Nashville International Film Festival with a film called Virtual Frankenstein, right? Uh, actually, actually, that was a, uh, that was a teleplay that I did with, did with someone. Uh, but I, and so a teleplay that I hope will get out there somewhere so, and find a home. I, I have uh, had the privilege to work with so many wonderful people from all around the world. And that's one of the hallmarks of my writing career. I love working with people. Yeah, yeah. And film is such a, I'm a huge fan of film. And uh, I, I just, uh, well, good luck with that. that. That's good. I know it's interesting that you should say that if there's any industry that's worse than the book industry to break into is the film industry. <laughs> that's, that's a tough, it's a tough go then. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're hungry for material, but it seems like the barriers to entry, I think, are very uh, are very high because it is a business. As uh, some people have said repeatedly in talks that I attend, it's a business. It's show business. Yeah, right. It's a business. Exactly. Money has to be made. No, they're not doing it for. Yeah, right. It's not done for it as it were, altruistic purposes or something. Um, I wanted to finish off by sort of circling back to your book, but asking you a question that's related to selfishly to me. Uh, I've, I've, for various reasons, I've opted out of all social media. So I used to be on Twitter until I got gang attacked a couple of times. Ugh. I used to be on Facebook until I got sick of the interface and sick of the trivia. I used to be on mm -hmm. Instagram, which I found is probably the best of them as far as simplicity goes, but I'm on none of those. And the question I wanted to ask you now is, is the fact that I'm on, and I'm not on TikTok, uh, I've never seen, you know, I heard a lot about it. Is the fact that I'm not on social media, am I missing out on something either information wise or culturally wise or any other kind of wise? That is a really good question. I think only some I think only you can answer that. I certainly think that the glut of information and the compulsion to check it, which they kind of built into these platforms, they've admitted it. It's like brain hacking. Same thing with cell phones. I think that sometimes it does consume a lot of our attention. And as you say, it's the sorry about the gang attacks. That's horrible. I wish that they didn't do that and that's one of the more unfortunate things about social media it's like people feel that they're behind a computer they're invincible right. so and i make the metaphor in the book that it's like driving a car when you're behind the wheel of a car you think you're invincible but the the consequences for misusing a car can be well we all know it can be huge right uh physically emotionally um loss of life, whatever. But there's, we should treat social media with the same respect. And when you go on it, if you do decide to go back on it, you know, just be aware, be aware of that. Don't do it because you fear missing out on things. I think do it because it's a tool or because there's, you find something of value and can contribute something of value, knowing that the downsides are there, of you know the haters and things like that and don't feed the trolls that's the other thing the <laughs> like in the zoo <laughs> yeah do not feed the trolls but because there's there's always trolls one of um uh, one of the uh hosts dan bongino has this uh saying that it's five people eating hot pockets in their mother's basement and those are the people that are that are causing all the trouble so it's kind of it's kind of like the once you realize that mentality but 
it it is it does feel very damaging when you're ganged up virtually so uh i think you're a guy that has that is very sincere that has a lot a lot to share and you have this reach already with your podcast uh you'll you'll find your tribe i think it's all about finding your tribe and speaking your message and just being smart i i would just say you know if you do decide to go back on those platforms just just do it with with uh with your shield up with your shields up star trek style right right i'll i'll, I'll think about it i i really hesitate to go back but uh... You, you are awesome. I this I mean, just like the book, which really surprised me. It's not that I would I thought you weren't going to be awesome, but uh, there's a sort of a, a a quiet but strong humor and firm wealth of information in you, and I really appreciate that. Thanks for coming on. Well, this was a delightful conversation, and I I echo you, and I wish you good luck with your podcast and I'm sure that your loyal listeners are going to are going to find you no matter what. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. And that's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. Check out the show's website at writingediting.ca and also please contact me anytime if there's any topic specific or general that you'd like me to cover on the show. I'll be back on Thursday. Please join me.